Hey there, it's Pete Thorne. Welcome to my studio and welcome to another Wednesday Q&A. This is where I answer the questions that you ask me via sending an email to my Facebook music page. You can go to that page, send me an email there, and I'll try and get to your questions in one of these Q&A videos. So uh, let's get to question number one. Uh, this is from a fellow in Belgium. His name is Didier, and he wants to know how I go about setting the master volume and the EQ on a plexi style, like a Marshall plexi style tube amp. Uh, how do I find the sweet spot? Um, well, first of all, most plexis don't have master volumes unless they've been modified or unless they're like a new boutique version that maybe has a master volume added to the circuit. Um, uh, my Sur SL68, for instance, which is like a 68 style Marshall plexi uh, type circuit, uh, does have a master volume. It's got a great post, post phase inverter master volume. Um, that means that the master actually comes in the circuit after the phase inverter tube. Uh, the uh, sort of thinking behind that design is that the phase inverter tube has a lot to do with the sound of a, a, a vintage plexi when you crank the amp and you can preserve a lot of the tone by putting the master volume after that tube uh, and right before the power tubes because uh, technically the phase inverter uh, the tube is sort of part of the power amp of the amp uh, so anyway, um, you want to set the master, if, if your Plexi style amp does happen to have one, as high as possible, I would say, uh, to preserve uh, the majority of that cool tone that the amp has. So whatever the playing situation that you're in dictates, uh, get, you know, try and get away with as much loud as you can on that master because, uh, you know, no matter how well the master is designed, um, they all will affect the tone of that sort of glorious wide open tone uh, that we all love. Um, you know, the lower and lower that that volume control gets. So uh, set the master as high as you can if your Plexi style amp has one. The EQ, um, well, first of all, uh, Plexi's they vary so much. I mean, we, Plexi sort of means, you know, anything from the uh, single JTM 45 style amp through super basses to super leads and all the way from like, I guess like 65 or 66 through, uh, through mid 69, I guess, is when they switched to the metal pedal amps. Um, so they vary in circuit you know, a lot. So it just depends on the particular amp you have. Uh, one thing to really look at with vintage plexi style amps is uh, the bright cap. And so the bright cap is a, is a capacitor that goes on the, the, the volume control of the amp on the volume one or channel one of the amp. Many, many of those old amps, they've, they've got a, a capacitor soldered there on the volume control. It's designed to keep the amp clear and kind of, uh, you know, add some gain and stuff like that, make it real open sounding at lower volumes. And then as you turn it up, that cap actually goes out of the circuit. So when the, when the volume knob's all the way on 10, that capacitor is not having any effect on the amp tone. Uh, but as you bring it down, uh, it, it, it has an increasing effect. Um, now, the value of that cap is, is I can't stress enough, uh, it has such an impact on the overall tone of the amp. Um, if you find that you've got a plexi amp and it's kind of bright and ice picky at, at lower volumes and then you like it more and more as you crank it up, uh, you might have a good competent tech look at the value of that bright cap on the volume control. Because uh, you can switch it out real easy, it's like a you know 60 cent part or whatever, and um, it vastly changes the tone of the amp. Um, you can even remove the cap, and uh, that's actually how my my SL68 is. Is I've removed the bright cap. They they come with one, but I love the tone of the amp without the cap. Um, you know, some people they like the you know the, you know the tone of different caps. Just depends. So you uh, you can take the amp to a, a tech, like I say, if you don't like the tone of your plexi style amp, have them experiment with different value of bright caps and it'll affect uh, the frequencies that that cap works at uh, and uh, make the amp sound totally different. Okay, so having said all that, as far as the EQ goes, EQ on a Plexi style amp, um, you know, it's a subtractive style EQ. It's passive and subtractive. Now, I'm not an amp tech, but as I understand it, when all the EQ's on 10, it's kind of the closest to sort of being out of the circuit as possible. And then as you bring controls down from 10, you're reducing frequencies at that point and uh, subtracting frequencies. So, um, uh, you know, the Van Halen thing is run everything on 10, and that sounds great. But many times I find when I've got the volume on the amp, say anywhere from like four to maybe six or seven or eight, I don't want to run the EQ like that. I'll run it um, uh, presence somewhere between say four and six, something like that. The bass control is kind of a wild card. You can run it wherever you want. And once again, largely dependent on the circuit of the particular plexi style amp you have. Uh, some of them are kind of loose and flubby sounding depending on parts in the circuit. And you can really uh, help alleviate a lot of that flubby thing by rolling the bass down, sometimes off. Some people run the bass off on their, 
on their uh, you know Marshall Plexi style amps and can work fine and can sound really good. So you just experiment. On my SL68, I sometimes run it on like four or five, something like that. Mid-range control on uh, those old amps, it, pretty consistently I like to crank it up, um, like have it on eight to 10, something like that. That sounds good to me. And then the treble control, anywhere from you know four to six or seven, something like that. Uh, you know, once again, largely dependent on the amplifier. So uh, just experiment with some of that stuff. And, uh, and certainly uh, if you find your amps a little ice picky or bright sounding at lower volumes, have a good tech look into that bright cap on the volume control and maybe experiment with switching it out uh, for a different value. So question number two comes from a guy named Jordan. He wants to know about my musical beginnings and how I got started as a session player. Um, so it's funny, uh, I, I sort of don't consider myself primarily a session player. I think mainly, uh, to be fair, I've made my, my career as being a, uh, a touring guy for the most part, going on the road with different artists. Uh, but, you know, I do sessions and stuff like that too. And, and there's been large chunks of, uh, of time in the last 20 or so years where um, I've been in bands. And you know, been that guy where it's like you know you're you're just devoted to the band and, and you know you write songs with that band and tour with them and record with them and that kind of thing too. Uh, so yeah, I guess it just depends on the period that we're talking about. But um, let me see my musical beginnings. Uh, okay, so a kid moved into my neighborhood when I was about uh, ten years old or something like that, and he was really really advanced musically. Uh, a huge record collection and he could play guitar and he could play keyboards and all kinds of stuff so I was really fascinated with this kid he was you know he's a little bit older than me like a couple years older and yeah I was just like this kid's cool so I, I started hanging out with him luckily he wanted to hang out with me he wasn't like a jerk like oh you're two years younger than me or whatever I don't want to hang out with you like kids can be you know uh, but he showed me the first chords I ever knew on the guitar and he got me really into listening to the Beatles and the Who and all kinds of music um, he had a really wide musical taste for a kid that was only like I think 12 or 13 or something like that he was listening to like Yes and uh, Van Morrison and Frank Zappa and uh, you know the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the Kinks and uh, the Jam and he just had this really really open mind for uh, a kid um, and uh, really talented as well great great musician so I guess that really inspired me and then he moved away and I, I kept playing guitar and stuff after that and just started playing in local bands sorry somebody's rocking in the next room and that's okay we love rock right um so um yeah basically it was that you know just uh, and growing up in a cold climate in edmonton uh canada i just you know kind of hunkered down during the cold months and just played guitar all the time i loved it um so uh i decided i would move to la and uh, go to mi that was like a dream of mine and i just from the time i was about 14 i knew that that's what i wanted to do and at 19, I did it. I moved to LA and uh, yeah, did a year at MI. And then I met a guy uh, coming uh, right out of music school. A uh, guy, still a friend of mine. His name's Frank Symes. He's a terrific player. He's actually tours with The Who now and, uh, and lots of other bands. Uh, he's, God, he's got a long career playing with like Stevie Nicks and Don Hanley and all kinds of people. Um, Mick Jagger. Uh, he's a really, really great career. But anyway, he was, he was a, a, a big influence on me. I think I was 19 or 20 and he was like uh you know maybe mid 30s or something like that and i joined his his band right out of mi and we wrote uh over the next uh five years or so we wrote about 50 songs and demoed them and that's really how i learned how to record and engineer I was working with frank in his home studio he had one of those old akai uh 12 track recorders that you, you guys probably out there probably never even seen this thing but it's like a, a kai 12 track machine with a built-in mixer and it recorded on what looked like betamax tape and uh, like videotape it looked like uh proprietary kind of cartridges that you had to buy for this thing but anyway we, we demoed like 50 tunes on that and eventually got a record deal in japan um that was around 96 and we made a record for japan and southeast asia and that was really kind of my beginnings was you know i just hunkered down and worked on that band for a long long time we never got a deal in the states but we finally got signed in japan and made this record for the japanese market and that was how i became a, a professional musician and ever since then i guess i've never really had a day job i've just been uh you know doing different gigs and been in a couple more signed bands and things like that and one thing led to another and here i am sitting in front of you now Question number three comes from Christopher Crooms. He wants to know, uh, let's see, he wants to know about the PT100 SE. He wants to know, how did John, Sir, and I go from uh, a tone or sound in our heads and uh, 
and design that into an electronic circuit, which ultimately became my signature sound. Uh, sort of, you know, the process of developing that amp. Well, um, I live in LA and Sarah's out in Lake Elsinore, so it was a lot of talking on the phone and then uh, it's about an hour and a half uh, out, of, out of LA. So I would drive out there very, very often. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, just we, we just work on the amp. And it's kind of an amazing process, actually, I guess. You know, if you can imagine, you're like with this master guitar and amp builder guy that is uh, a really good friend of mine, but also just a, like a total genius. And, uh, you know, he would sit there with the amp open on the chat or the chassis open on the bench. And we'd have the amp plugged into the cabinet. And I'd say, what about a little more of this or that? And he'd say, do you think it needs more of this or that? And then he'd, you know, the soldering iron. And then, okay, let's check that out. And sometimes he could, you know, kind of put in a couple caps at a time and show you how two sounded and the difference between those. And it was really just a lot of that. Um, and sometimes he'd design something like the new boost in the uh, in the PT100 SE. He'd say, hey, I think I got like something really cool. I uh, came up with an idea for this MOSFET boost circuit. And, you know, come out and listen to it. We'll stick it in an amp. And uh, that kind of thing, you know, where we'd both just be brainstorming and thinking about it. Um, you know, the amp started off as uh, closest to like maybe the custom audio, uh, 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 what's it called? The uh, Classic Plus, I believe. Um, and uh, which was like an EL34, you know, close on channel two to kind of that Marshall y sort of thing. And uh, so that was the original circuit design that the PT evolved from. We made the first custom audio version, and then it was just a slow evolution all the way towards the. Uh, the Sur PT100 SE that uh, that is out now, and um, yes, there was some some really amazing uh, uh, times though in, throughout the design of the amp. I remember one incredible thing was John came up with a transformer switcher uh, because he's like I say he's brilliant, and so he figured out how he, we could have two output transformers outside of the amp on a switcher and switch between them and listen to the tone of them. Because normally, you know, output transformer it takes a minute to switch out of an amp. I mean, for an experienced tech, it's probably like 15 or 20 minutes to swap out an output transformer, and that's like working fast. So if you're listening to the tone of an output transformer, and okay, let's change it, and you take 15 or 20 minutes in between, and then put in the other one, and, okay, let's listen to that one. It's like, to me, it's like you've forgotten what the other one sounds like, basically. Uh, so the fact that we could actually compare transformers on a switcher and instantly flip between them. That was like incredible to me. So we listened to, you know, like maybe five different transformers uh, from all the different uh, major manufacturers out there that we could think of. And that's how we settled on the one that uh, actually ended up going into the amp. But yeah, it was really just this really organic, fun experience of us sitting there and kind of, you know, shooting the shit and gabbing about guitar and tone and, and uh, you know, ideas and then actually sitting there with the amp and switching out parts and stuff while I'm like playing through it. Sometimes I'd like to hear him play because he's a really good guitar player. Not a lot of people know that about John, but he used to play in bands like way back in the day um, in, in New York and Jersey and stuff like that. And he's a great guitar player with like a lot of tone in his hands. So um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes it's fun to like uh, give the guitar to somebody else. Like if it's your rig and go, can you play for a minute? And just like listen, because it's like a different perspective on the sound when you're not physically playing when you're just listening so uh, many times at gigs I love to do that I like to walk out front and listen to my guitar in the PA while somebody else plays it and just check out the tone next question comes from Alan Garber he wants to know how I use my two Eventide H9s that are on my pedal board <clears throat> kind of you know how I utilize them and specifically how I use them with a mission expression pedal uh, when I'm doing uh, harmonies uh, so basically um, when, when I've got one of them set up for a harmony usually diatonic harmony uh, what I'll use the mission pedal for is, you know, sometimes in a certain guitar part, maybe you want the harmony part to be like a fourth interval, and sometimes maybe you want it to be a fifth. So you can set it up very simply using the H9 control app on your iPhone or iPad or whatever, uh, so that the expression pedal, when, when maybe it's at the heel position, it's a fourth interval, and swing it down to the end, you know, to, to the, the toe position, excuse me, and then you'll have like a fifth interval, or whatever you want. Um, uh, you could set it up uh, if you want with uh, two different harmonies going on and when you swing the pedal it maybe goes you know from a I don't know like a, a fifth and a seventh or something to an octave and something else whatever you want um, so it's not hard to do and really easy to program uh, when I first got the two H9s my my thinking was you know I'll have one basically dedicated to reverb and then I'll have the other one uh, <clears throat> be for pitch stuff, uh, and I needed that uh, for the gig I was doing at the time, playing with Don Hanley, and I really wanted to uh, do some diatonic harmony stuff 
on some of the older Eagles material and whatnot. So um, that's what I was thinking, like reverb pitch. But uh, in practice, I've actually used it for all kinds of stuff because they sound really great. So then, uh, uh, you know, lots of delay stuff with them. Um, uh, I used them for, yeah, just numerous different things. The black hole reverb, super cool. I started using that a lot. Um, using that with the expression pedal on a gig I'm doing this Saturday where I set it up so that uh, I've got the mix like off and then I blend in the black hole reverb real slow uh, for this one guitar part and it just kind of overtakes the guitar sound and then ends up being this huge wash of reverb. It sounds really cool. So uh, a lot of fun with the H9s. Question number five, last question comes from John. He wants to know about some of my favorite plugins and specifically what I like to use on the master bus or the kind of the two mix uh, when I'm uh, bouncing out mixes. Um, so I really love uh, plugins from both Universal Audio and Steven Slate. Uh, I tend to use uh, a lot of the different UA plugins, and I, I love you know uh, their Neve EQs and their uh, API style EQs, 1176 and LA2A, kind of the usual suspect uh, uh, plugins. Love all those. Love their Oceanway Studios plugin. It's a really terrific uh, kind of room emulator. Um, specifically on the master bus, uh, so if I'm doing like a pedal video demo and that kind of thing, I, I like to keep the uh, the master bus you know free of uh, compression and EQ and things like that. I, I really want you to hear the tone of the pedal or the amp or whatever I'm doing a demo of. Uh, so um, all I'll use is some peak limiting generally, and I'll use the Universal Audio uh, peak limiter uh, on the master bus. Now if I'm mixing a song, uh, you know that's a little different story. I like to use some more stuff. So I'll use the uh, SSL uh, G bus compressor from uh, Universal Audio, kind of a standard. Uh, just sounds great. Love that for a bus compressor. Uh, I'll use the Slate uh, v, uh, VTM, which is a virtual tape machine sometimes on the on the uh, two mix bus. Uh, I'll set it to the two inch setting and it emulates basically an analog tape deck like an old Ampex or something. And it just adds a bit of warmth and uh, you know, it just sounds wonderful. Uh, and then for a, a last in line for a limiter, uh, I'll use the uh, Slate FGX uh, mastering processor. It's got a compressor and limiter in it, but I'll just use the limiting portion since I'm already getting the compression from the UA uh, G-Bus series compressor. Uh, so yeah, the FGX is really wonderful for uh, a mastering style limiter. There's no substitute for you know real pro mastering, but for many of the you know kind of quick and dirty jobs and things that I'm doing here in this room, I need to master. So um, that FGX it just really preserves the the tone of your mix while pumping uh, pumping up the overall average level. You can get a really nice hot competitive level, but it doesn't suck the dynamics out of the mix. It sounds really punchy, and you still hear all the uh, you know the articulation and the the attack of the drums and stuff like that and uh, just, just does a great job of keeping your mix sounding like it's supposed to uh, and yet bumping up that overall average level to a nice hot kind of competitive level. All right, uh, thanks for joining me for my Wednesday Q&A. Uh, please come back and see me uh, for more videos real soon. Hit subscribe if you haven't. Come back and see my channel often. I really like having you here. I am Pete Thorne. Take it easy.